Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our live discussion. I'm Amanda Paris, host of CBC Arts' Exhibitionist and Marvin's Room on CBC Radio. As we get closer to the anniversary of Canada's Confederation, we are taking a look at different aspects of Canada's history and different perspectives on how that history has been shaped. Tonight, we're talking about Black Canadian history. What has been left out of Canada's history? And how do we do a better job of getting the perspectives of Black people into our story? And we want to hear from you. Leave comments and ask questions. We have a team of producers monitoring what you post on Facebook or YouTube so that we can include your voice in the discussion as well. Joining me today, we have in Champaign, Illinois, Karen Flynn, Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and African American Studies at the University of Illinois. And here in Toronto, Afua Cooper, James R. Johnston Chair in Black Canadian Studies at Dalhousie University and the President of the Black Canadian Studies Association. Nikki Clark, President of the Ontario Black History Society. And Andrea Davis, Chair of the Department of Humanities, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University and Associate Professor of Black Cultural Studies. So we are very excited to have you all here today and very excited to start this conversation with all of you tonight. Um, I think, first of all, just a reminder to our viewers, please send us your questions and comments. But I'm going to start with my questions and I want to start with you, Dr. Cooper. Uh, in your experience, how well does the average Canadian know black history in Canada? The average Canadian does <laughs> know a lot about black history in Canada, in my experience. Um, if people are pressed to give an answer, they will say something about the Underground Railroad. I think that's the extent of most people's knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we have a very long history in this country, black people, and it's very extensive. And it goes from coast to coast, to coast. Um, but most people don't know about that aspect of her broader history. Well, the way a lot of us know about history is through school. And so, Dr. Andrew Davis, you were actually the first teacher that taught me so much about Black Canadian history specifically. Um, how well is Black history being integrated into how we are being taught Canadian history? Not well. I think we still continue to think about something called Canadian history and then something called Black history without understanding the ways in which Black history is essential to informing our understanding of Canadian history. And I think that as academics, we, and within the wider educational system, we need to do a much, much better job of bridging those, mm -hmm. of making those, those connections. Dr. Flynn, would you agree with that assessment? Absolutely. I think, um, as, as uh, Dr. Davis pointed out, we have a tendency to sort of, um, you know, think about Canadian history and then perhaps add on Black Canadian history. And we do that at particular moments, mm. such as Black History Month, right? Or in terms of, you know, school curriculum or even when, um, you know, I was a student myself in Canada, um, sort of, the, the, you know, the end of the semester, if you will, um, after we have covered what we consider to be Canadian history. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've been talking generally about Canadians overall, but for Nikki, how do you think black, how much do you think black Canadians know about their own history? Well, I have to echo the sentiments of my colleagues here that um, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, just from my own observations, uh, going frontline and doing presentations and just asking what the working knowledge of uh, black history is, there's a lot of leaning towards the understanding of American black history and very little about uh, Canadian black history. Uh, Dr. Cooper, you're a chair of Black Canadian Studies. Would you say that that's something that people understand and that people have a strong sense of that history or is it something that you still have to explain to folks what that looks like? I think you, you still have to explain to people, uh, everybody, I mean, white, blacks, um, um, Asians, what black history uh, looks like. I'm in Nova Scotia and, <clears throat> and we have around 47 historically black communities mm. in Nova Scotia. And these communities have been there since the, the middle to the late 18th century. So people there in those communities do have a sense of themselves. They do have a sense of history and a sense of place. Many people 
uh, probably, you know, can't pinpoint specific dates as that, but they, they, they know the general contours. They know the contours of the loyalist migration, whether it's free loyalist or, or enslaved black loyalist. They know the general contours of the history of the refugees of war of 1812 and, and the Maroon. So, so there is that historical um, <clears throat> knowledge, there's that historical presence within that particular space of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to some degree, which um, unless you, you really delve deep, you don't find that in other provinces. But I, I, I should say, though, that things are getting better through the efforts of organizations like the Ontario Black, Black History Society um, and, and other organizations, uh, both people within the academy people within the academy, that is people like myself and Andrea and others, and people outside the academy, um, like Nikki, Ni, Coney in Alberta, for example, um, folks in, in, in British Columbia are making that effort. And for me, I'm chair of black studies at Dalhousie University, but one of my objectives, which I've always, it's always been in my life as a black person in Canada, as an a academic is to bridge this gap between ac um, the academy and community because as academic people we, we study this knowledge we go in the archives we extract knowledge but how do we um, disseminate that knowledge mm -hmm. to everybody it's mm -hmm. not just for us in the ivory tower or in the ebony tower so Nikki you're not I see you nodding you're on the front lines you're doing a lot of community work what, right. do you, what are your thoughts about that about making this knowledge accessible about finding ways to share this knowledge with a larger group of people than are in the, the ivory tower of the academy well that's um, that's, that's a great question and uh, uh, yes uh, the the mandate of the Ontario Black History Society is to promote protect and preserve black history and uh, we go out as as you mentioned into the front line we go to um, school boards mm -hmm. and we fill in the gap that's missing in the school curriculum uh, and then we also go into boardrooms uh, of corporations and fill in that information as well so it it just comes to the point where um, we just need more numbers uh, to, to, as uh, Dr. Afwa alluded to, uh, to disseminate this information, and we need interest, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we need the resources to make it happen. Um, there, there's, if we can have everyone collaborate on this effort, I think it would be a smoother functioning, but like I said, we're work in progress. So we have a comment from one of our viewers, Kathy Grant. She wrote, it is up to us to ensure our stories are told. Canada has a rich black Canadian history coast to coast. You have to push and make sure it gets in the classrooms, the museums, and the exhibits. So I'm gonna point this to you, Dr. Davis. A lot of your work is not just in the realm of history, it's mm -hmm. showing our history through literature, mm -hmm. through art. Can you talk a little bit about sharing this knowledge in ways outside of the academic mm -hmm. study? Mm -hmm. I think, I'll, I'll go to your question a slightly different way. I think that one of the things that's so exciting about Canada as a black space, and um, we don't say that often, is the way in which it brings together these multiple diasporas, right? So these mm -hmm. multiple intersections of experiences. So people who have been here historically for a very long time, post kind of 1950s, 1960s immigrants, largely from the Caribbean and then continental Africans, and then a steady influx of African Americans at different periods. So the history itself is interconnected and then the discourse or the ways in which we enter it through is also multiple and, mm -hmm. and diverse in a way that you don't really find in other places. So the US tends to be, right? I mean, certainly no black cultural production is homogenous, but tends to be more, more discreet in a way that is more diffuse in Canada, which I think is wonderful and opens up these fabulous spaces for us to think about blackness in unique ways mm -hmm. um, that are fed also, or can be fed also in part by our own narrating of ourselves as a different kind of multicultural nation. And I think that the artists are the ones who are really talking about that in powerful ways. So even hip hop artists, Canadian hip hop artists, um, and the writers, so Dionne Brand or Essie Dugan, um, you know, in her, in her novel, The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, in which she talks about a black community in, in Western Canada, in Alberta. Dionne Brand's novels, which 
which talk about what it means to live in multiple locations of the diaspora and to narrate that through the experiences of blackness. And then the work that cultural studies theorists like Rinaldo Walcott are doing or Catherine McKittrick is doing through geography, I think those are all important entry points into thinking about what it means to be black in Canada. So Dr. Flynn, I see you nodding over there. Um, <laughs> and I know that you can talk a little bit about that contrast between the United States and the Canadian experience. You're teaching over in the United States, but you obviously right. have a Canadian perspective that you're bringing to the table. I do. And I, 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 so one of the things that I recall in terms of my own personal experience um, at the University of Windsor as a master's student was, sort, was the shift in my own consciousness about what it means to do my work. And, and focus that work on on you know, on, on you know on Black Canadians and, and Black women um, specifically, and so it's often very interesting um, teaching um, in the United States in a department that is that is African American studies and actually really sort of introducing you know students and faculty and and particular students to. Um, to the fact that black people have lived in, um, have had this long history in Canada, and they're often very, 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 very surprised um, that that's the case. And, 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 you know, students will say, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize, um, um, you know, that black people had this long history. Well, thanks to people like Drake, right, um, um, hip hop uh, R&B artists like Drake, students are becoming, um, you know, a little bit more familiar with the fact that, yes, you know, black, black people do have lived in Canada. I'm also contributed to, to this idea of nation building. And sometimes we tend to forget, right, the contributions of black Canadians um, to Canada's nation building enterprise and, and, and project. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious from everybody, really, what do Canadians lose by not having this history represented? What is the country losing out on by not having this history well known? And anybody can jump in for this. Well, I think we're at a crucial juncture right now at the 150. Mm. And we, we're having this discussion here at CBC. And one, one of the things that the 150 has opened up is, um, is this idea. Everyone is coming out now and putting forth their idea uh, or their ideas on the table. And that's fantastic because people are realizing that the country um, is losing or the country will lose if all these voices are not heard, if all these stories are not told. So I'm actually excited to be where we are because it's not just about cakes and balloons <laughs> anymore or, or blowing off a big bugle. It, the 150 has opened up all these spaces, all these opportunities for us to have this discussion. Um, the, the whole idea of the two solitudes, that's gone. Yeah. I don't even think that's taught in school anymore. I, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not in high school. It's certainly not taught in universities anymore. That's gone. We are at this multicultural moment. And in this multicultural moment, we are uh, people who work in black history, who work in black studies are saying that um, this is who we are, this is where we are. But at the same time though, we have been doing this for at least a hundred years. 50 years, if, if, uh, if I'm pushed, this idea of putting black history or black studies on the Canadian map has been going on for a long time, it has been going on for a, a, a long time. So it, it's not something new, as has been um, said here, what, what we need are resources. My chair at Dalhousie is the only black studies chair in all of Canada. It's the only academic chair, uh, black studies chair in all of Canada. We need more of um, something like a cheer. We need more to center these studies, to center this experience, because black people have been here. Um, we know the documents tell us, if we go by the documents, since 1604. Mm -hmm. That's over 400 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and talking about the multiple streams, the diverse streams. And so from 1604 to present time, um, yes, uh, maybe the vast majority of us came after the Second World War, but this is a tremendously long history mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. so I, I mean, blacks have been here before the English came here. I just want to say <laughs> yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So I want to go back to that starting point, but before I do, I want to find out from you, Nikki, do you feel as optimistic about this current moment as Dr. Cooper is expressing? Do you think that there's something brewing right now that is showing some progress, or do you have some different thoughts on that? 
I think it is exciting, and I am a hopeless optimist, <laughs> in that um, there is a movement for people to embrace diversity and, and to be open to the stories, um, the illustrations of, of uh, uh, people coming to Canada and to learn from each other's stories, and, and their parallels mm -hmm. in, in the story. So, um, yeah, it, it is a really good time, and uh, it's, it's uh, amazing to see um, people coming together mm -hmm. to embrace this idea. Okay, so for any of our viewers that are super new to this conversation, Dr. Cooper, how do you determine the starting point of black history in Canada? You said 1604. <laughs> how do you determine what happened in 1604? <laughs> Just give us the Cole's Notes version. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We determine, um, because that date was the, the date that was presented to us um, in the documents of the French, at Port Royal, Port Royal being in Nova Scotia, Nouvelle Ecosse at the moment, uh, you know, at that time, um, of a, a, a black man called a Negro working as a servant for Sir Dumont. Sir Dumont was the, the, gov the French governor of Acadie. Um, and then, uh, again, uh, fast forward four years later, there's Matthew de Costa, for whom we have records as 1608, again, working in service uh, of the French or to, to the French. And he was a, a translator and an interpreter um, for, Fr for the French, French language, and the local Aboriginal people, the Mi'kmaq people. So, and, and those are documented. Mm -hmm. We have the records for those. Mm -hmm. And these people, it seems, were free people, these two men that I'm talking about. If we fast forward to 1628, and we're now in Quebec City, we, the, the African presence there as represented by Olivier Lejeune, but he is enslaved. Mm -hmm. He is a little nine-year-old boy who is enslaved. Um, he, uh, he comes from Africa by one of Samuel de Champlain's friends. Samuel de Champlain is the founder of Quebec. And at the same time as Canada is being founded in the settler sense, um, here, here we have slavery. As the, as the century matures, we find the overwhelming majority of Africans who are coming into what we now call Canada are enslaved. And throughout the 18th century, um, then through in that long century, the 18th century, we also have the free black loyalists coming from the United States as a result of the American Revolution. But we also have white loyalists bringing their enslaved African property with them. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, we have the Maroons coming from Jamaica in 1796. Fast forward, 1813, 1816, refugees of the War of 1812. Again, these people fought for the British mm -hmm. in the United States. British transported them to Canada, i.e. Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Then later on, as we confederated in 1867, uh, and um, Canada now opened up as a, as a country that is supposedly welcoming immigrants, but they did not want black people. Mm -hmm. But we still have those African-Americans mm -hmm. insisting yes. on coming in, yes. coming mm -hmm. in from the Plains States, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and so on, to Western Canada. And so, I forgot the underground railroad. <laughs> okay, we're going <laughs> to get travelers. <laughs> 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 so, yes, we're going to get... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Let me yeah. jump in there, because yeah. you've given us an incredible timeline, and mm -hmm. I want to jump into yeah, that okay. timeline. Excellent. So we're talking about the Underground Railroad. We're talking a little bit about slavery in Canada. Uh, how did slavery shape the Canada that we know today? What was the impact of this institution in this country? Nikki, start us off, and we're going to go around and talk a little bit about this huge moment in Canadian history that a lot of people don't seem to know about? Uh, well, in uh, the 1600s, I think, and Dr. Efwa jump in with the date, I think it was 1680 <laughs> something with uh, King Louis in yeah. France. Yeah, something like um, that. They, they so. wanted to build up the, uh, the economic um, state in New France uh, by bringing in cheap labor. So this is where there was uh, en masse uh, importation of black slaves into Canada. And, uh, and then it just uh, grew from there. Um, they were brought in as chattel. Um, so they were used as domestics uh, in the home uh, to raise children. Um, they, were, um, they worked with merchants. Uh, they were um, slaves to priests, to nuns. Uh, so the, the slaves uh, built New France uh, along with um, the, uh, the, the um, Aboriginal slaves that were there originally in um, the 1600s. So um, this, this free workforce uh, was there and, and um, 
built up Canada, mm -hmm. pretty much. And I believe they're also involved in like agricultural, mining, there are various yes. variations. Yeah, for uh, trade. Yeah, and what, trade. so we often hear about the Underground Railroad. That's a, that's a present, that's something that I definitely learned about in high school, at least mm -hmm. in a paragraph in a textbook. Um, so I'm curious about what the impact of the current portrayal of Canada's role in the Underground Railroad has on our understanding of history. Dr. Davis, if you can jump in there, yeah. I'd love to go to Dr. Um, Flynn right after. That's interesting. That's a really good question for the moment, I think, because it, I mean, we have that kind of, historical narration, right, that continues to the current moment about Canada as a particular kind of liberal democracy. I like to, kind, I like to call it an exceptional democracy um, that the Underground Railroad feeds into and narrates and re-narrates over and over again. And I think the moment that you alluded to with Nikki, right, the moment in which we stand is not just a Canadian moment, it's a global moment. Where, where we know that something is happening right now and that 10, 20 years, 30 years, the historians are going to look back and talk about that moment. And, and we're certainly for me, right, as, as an individual, but also as a, an educator, thinking about the ways in which I can intervene in that moment to produce something that is productive. And one of the things that I see um, in the moment is the way in which Canada um, because of this long historical self-positioning as this exceptional democracy, beside the United States, right, beside the kind of increasingly loud populist um, um, arguments coming out of the United States, that Canada has begun to emerge again as this kind of oppositional democracy, this kind of exceptional democracy that has led, right, is leading now to the out-migration of non-white and, and non-Christian immigrants from the United States, almost through the identical, right, root mm. border points as that early um, 20th century migration um, through through Western Canada, which is really interesting. So, so we have seen a repeat of the Underground Railroad absolutely, almost. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, also it's a, a repeat in the, in the way that it's being described and defined. Absolutely, so that here we have in this moment this, this re-emergence of Canada as a new kind of North Star. And a place that you will go despite the harshness of the weather, mm -hmm. you will lose fingers and limbs and arms to go to this place. You will cross the border and immediately be arrested. Mm -hmm. But somehow that is better than the place that you are. And it's deceptive. It, it's a... It's, it's, it's a deceptive um, narrative that still continues, and, and that is a narrative that still makes invisible blackness in Canada, because to make blackness in Canada visible is to narrate another kind of democracy, mm -hmm. which we're not always comfortable doing. So I want to talk a little bit more about that invisible, invisibility in Canada. Dr. Flynn, if you can talk a little bit about this idea of, one, un the Underground Railroad making Canada the site of freedom, but also how that invisibilizes the contemporary context of ca black Canadians living here, and also a historical context of black Canadians and the struggles that they've gone through on this land and in this country. Right. So in, in, in terms of the the, the Underground Railroad is critical to how Canada as a nation constructs itself. And it constructs itself vis-a-vis -vis the United States, as uh, Dr. Davis pointed out. So we don't have, at least we tell ourselves, we, did, we don't have, we didn't, ha we, don't, we didn't have the KKK. Some of us believe that no slavery existed in Canada. We don't have this sordid past, you know, of lynchings and, and riots. Right, so Canada constructs its its national identity. It's predicated on the idea um, of being a benevolent nation that opens its doors, particularly when we, we're talking about the the you know the the underground railroad. And it opened its doors. It's the it's the promise. It's the it was the promised land, and in so doing, that part that national narrative, if you will, does not account or or address. The, the the racism that those settlers faced when they when they migrated here. There's no discussion of segregation, right? Even though it, you know, in a lot of instances, it wasn't de jure segregation, it was de facto segregation. So when we think of this place, um, you Sorry, know- Sorry, could you called, just uh, define de jure and de facto for those of us that might not know <laughs> the distinction exactly? <laughs> 
Okay, so Dijon would be sort of legalized, you know, legalized segregation, right, as um, as manifested in the southern United States, and de facto would just be sort of informal um, kind of segregation um, embodied in our in our schools, for example. A lot of Canadians um, are not aware that at one point in our history, um, we had schools that were segregated. Mm -hmm. Right, and I believe that the last one, the last uh, was 19, I believe 1963, that the um, you know Ontario closed its 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 doors to a segregated school. So that this that so in in, in constructing this national narrative, that um, that particular uh, those particular issues are left unaddressed. Yeah. Right. So, Similarly, uh, in sort of, you were talking about this question of, of invisibility. Uh, we, in, in terms of the, the, the history itself, we, uh, we are selective um, in when we sort of evoke Black Canadianness, and we evoke Black Canadianness through that narrative of the Underground Railroad, right? And of course, that has a, a lot of implications for how we t how we we narrate Canadian history, how we memorialize Canadian history, and how we tell and even write that history. So you brought us to a really interesting point. Uh, a lot of the time when we talk about this idea of a civil rights movement, it's specific and very uh, consistently a United States and an American perspective and context. I don't even think I hear the term civil rights movement used in a Canadian context. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the civil rights movement looked like here and the fact that there was one and there was a fight against the segregation that you're speaking about? Right, and so one of the um, one of the the places that I, in terms of my own research that I looked at, um, was Dresden, right, um, in the sort of 1940s and 50s, and that pl that particular place was really a, a, a hotbed of civil rights activities much of which we know very little about. There was an organization called the, you know, the Dresden Unity uh, Dresden Association, and they had, um, and it was a sort of a multicultural organization that came together to address, um, you know, what folks would refer to Dresden as Little Dixie because of the segregation that existed in that com in that community in terms of, you know, black people not a lot, not being excluded from, um, you know, hotels. Restaurants, right? And we see that um, in in uh, the, the 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 dawn of t the dawn of tomorrow, the Canadian and the Canadian Negro. And so, you know, when we think about civil rights active civil rights activism, uh, I think it's important to also expand the paradigm um, to think about newspapers, right, as being a part of. Um, a part of the civil rights movement, if you will. So the dawn of tomorrow, the Canadian Negro, these black newspapers, the editorials they wrote, they're bringing awareness, or even going farther back to the Canadian, um, the uh, uh, the provincial, the provincial freeman, the voice of the voice of uh, Henry Bibbs, voice of the fugitive. Right, that these newspapers were also a part of the civil, the, the civil rights movement. We've got a lot of organizations: United Negro Im Improvement Association, um, the, the the national, um, the Canadian Negro um, Association, for example, the Na Negro Citizenship Association, and that organization under um, the leadership of Don Moore was really critical as well in terms of. Um, the, the issue around migration, right? There was this, the Canada had an exclusionary migration policy up until 1967 that it excluded um, people, black people, Caribbean people in particular. And it was the national, this, this sort of, you know, Don Moore, this Negro Citizens Association who would go to Ottawa, right? They would uh, go to Ottawa and, and have these conversations with the government in terms of changing the, um, the, the immigration, the immigration laws. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel like we're developing a syllabus for our audience in a little bit. So, Nikki, can you give us some important figures or organizations who made really important contributions to the civil rights movement and to the fight against segregation in Canada as well? Can you add to our growing syllabus that we're creating? Uh, well, I, I have to mention uh, Viola Desmond, uh, 1946, going into a movie theater and. Uh, being um, dragged out of uh, the white section of the movie theater because um, she paid for a ticket and wanted to sit closer to the screen. Um, and then uh, being jailed subsequently and uh, fought against a, um, a charge for not paying a one cent um, movie tax. 
uh, charge for tax evasion, uh, which was actually resistance to racial discrimination. Uh, so she is a very important part of the catalyst for civil rights in Canada. Uh, years before, Rosa Parks in the United States said, I'm tired of sitting at the back of the bus. Uh, so we honor her, and I'm so happy uh, to have her image and her reputation restored um, as we have her on the $10 bill next year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's been a very significant thing. It's also been a slightly controversial it thing has. to have her face uh, grace the $10 bill. Dr. Davis, you're not in. What are your thoughts on <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. There's, you know, Tubman on the, on the US 20, um, and Viola Jasmine on our, our 10. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily want to, to get into the controversy around that. Um, what is important, I think, is that is that the contribution that she made mm -hmm. is remembered and honored and and made a part of our Canadian story. And there's also there is also Christie. I don't I, I wasn't hearing Karen very well, so I don't know if she mentioned this, but there was was it Fred Christie Afua in 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 Montreal yeah. ten yeah. years before Viola Desmond, yes. Yes. who yeah, the, the, um, the Christie versus York. Yeah. Because um, York was the name of the tavern that mm -hmm. he went to and when was refused service. And, and, um, he, and he sued them. Mm -hmm. So there's a case and that went to the, to the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court of Canada. Well. Christo, yeah, Christo versus York. And that happened in Montreal. Yeah. 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 But if, if I may just point out that even before Viola Desmond, um, there was Carrie Best, mm. uh, the journalist Carrie Best from um, New Glasgow, the same town where um, Desmond had her troubles. Carrie Best was also dragged out of that cinema. The same cinema. The same cinema. Same cinema. Wow. Um, and Carrie Best um, started a newspaper as a result. So she was a, 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 a civil rights pioneer herself. And when Desmond, in, in 1946, when Desmond was dragged out of the cinema, Carrie Best used her newspaper, The Clarion, to highlight mm -hmm. um, the plight of Viola Desmond. In fact, they, um, Carrie Best is not very much remembered, I guess, outside of Nova Scotia, but she was pivotal mm. to the struggles in that province and was a, a, a pivotal figure in helping Viola Desmond launch her case to the Nova Scotia Supreme Court. So there were many others. I don't know if, um, if Karen had talked about Marcus Garvey. Mm. Marcus Garvey from the 19 teens into the 20s, into the 30s, agitating and advocating in all of Canada and the United States and the entire Americas, even in Africa. And it was in Nova Scotia where he gave that famous speech, Emancipate Yourself from Mental Slavery, which Bob Marley took and it made into a song. That was in um, Sydney, Nova Scotia, mm. or North Sydney. So we, we've had this long line of, of civil rights fighters. And Rocky Jones, who passed away recently, um, was, of course, um, iconic in the in in the struggle in Canada for 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 civil rights, I don't know if Karen also had mentioned the Sir George William University. Yes. No, no, we didn't yes. get to that. The, yeah. the, the 1969, mm -hmm. when when uh, black students and their allies, mm -hmm. um, Caribbean students uh, in particular, mm -hmm. um, were you know fighting for student rights. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we we know about the Kent State University yes. struggles mm -hmm. in the American context, but few people know that in Canada we also had the student movement mm -hmm. and that black students embodied that, that movement. And just to give context, so George Williams is was the name of the university that now is known as it's Concordia. Known as Concordia. Concordia. And so Montreal. it's 1969. Yes. And there's a fantastic film that the National Film Board, Selwyn Jacobs and Co. Um, produced called the ninth floor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it was on the ninth floor yes. of the university Sir Sir George Williams University that the whole computer incident happened and the computer room was burnt down and so many students were deported jailed beaten chased out of town I mean and that a lot of people don't know but that is when CSIS actually was founded because it was the RCMP that looked after that case. And when, um, when they did the, the report of the, the whole thing, um, the Canadian state said the RCMP is a police body, 
no, we need like a spy body for this kind of work. And CSIS was created. Mm. It was out of black student agitation in the province of Quebec, in Montreal, that that happened. But this was a pivotal moment wow. in the Canadian student movement and in black civil rights in this mm -hmm. country and on the continent because it really changed everything. Well, I think it's really important for us to have this conversation and to recognize that alongside a history of uh, migration and slavery, there's also a large history of resistance as well Absolutely. that's a part of this. I just want to share some comments that have been coming into us from Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherry Edmonds Flett says, in 1858, people of African descent came to Vancouver Island yes, from California, which is a very important history as well. She also mentions the African American abolitionists who came to Vancouver Island, like Nancy Davis Lester and her husband, Peter Mifflin. Uh, Kathy Grant mentions looking forward to the story of nurse Gloria Bayless, who immigrated from Barbados to <laughs> be shared. She challenged Hilton's Queen Elizabeth Hotel and won. Mm -hmm. Two of her children are Dr. Francois Bayless and MP Frank Bayless. And Julia Madison says, I wish we were taught about these people and events in school. Mm -hmm. So for those of our viewers who are sitting here eager and desiring to learn more. We've mentioned a few references and resources like the film Ninth Floor. The Ninth Floor. Let's hear Absolutely. some more stuff, books, movies. What are the things that you all would recommend? Uh, Dr. Flynn, I'll start with you. So um, I would I would recommend my own book. Can, may I do that? Oh, no. Of course you um, may do that. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just responding to Kathy Grant. Um, and um, so, the 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 Gloria Bayless um, the Gloria so I'm sort of looking at well no I am actually focusing now on the Gloria Bayless case um, that one of the very first or the very first case that actually was brought um, to court in Montreal when um, race was used um, as uh, used um, in the in the new law against racial discrimination so um, so my book Moving Beyond Borders it's a very long title so I never could remember what happens after the. <laughs> Nation, right, but it's about Black Canadian and um, Black women's history. I, I would also recommend. Um, I love Afua, Afua Cooper's book on Marie Joseph Angelique. I think that's one of. It's very extremely. It's so incredibly well researched and written. Um, the book, The Promise, The Promised Land, um, which is an edited collection. Uh, the film, The Road to Justice. Uh, Roger. Roger, McTair. I, McTair. Um, the uh, the uh, Ronaldo Walcott's book. Um, Black like who? Yes, Catherine McKittrick's book. I mean, we do have. There is a ton of resources, and I also think I, I think Dr. Davis mentioned this earlier. Um, there, you know, the novels, the, the novels, the, no, the novels, um, a, a range of novels, those even written by um, Black Canadians. Um, we need, I would also submit that we need, uh, we need some more studies on the, the church. Um, I know that I forgot the, uh, Afua, you might remember um, the author who's written the book on Reverend Jenny Johnson. I'm so that's sure. oh sorry, uh, Dr. Cooper. She was asking if you remember the book that was written about Dr. Sorry about Reverend Jenny Johnson, the yeah. author. Of the, the author. Book. Sorry, it, the author of the book. Yeah, it's by um, Nina Reed Maroney. <sighs> Nina Reed Maroney. Yes. Nina, yeah, that's a, that's a nice yeah. book. It is. It really. I guess I think that that's one of the we haven't really talked about in this discussion as well is the role of the black church, right, as a space for um, for not just um, you know for the not it just didn't serve the spiritual the the, the spiritual didn't just feed the spiritual um, needs of the community, but it served the social community, mm -hmm. the social social needs of the community. And we haven't really talked about the role of the church. So I think that that's also, when we think about civil rights, um, you know, expanding the paradigm to include in the, the churches as well. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned the church, I'm thinking about the role of the church in black communities in Canada. I'm thinking about the history of Africville and how central the church was there as well too. Right, um, exactly. I wanna pivot over to Nikki though. Uh, what are some resources that you would recommend for folks who are interested and eager to learn more about black Canadians? Here. And it can be books, movies. <laughs> um, well, as a former educator of young children, um, early childhood education specifically, uh, it's it's very important uh, for uh, children have, to have the knowledge very early and to have their identity set at, as an early at an early age. And um, that's why I would recommend um, the story of Albert Jackson, who was the first black postal worker. 
mm. uh, in Toronto and uh, the pressure that was put um, in his community with Sir John A. Macdonald, uh, because as he, uh, you know, went through the journey of becoming a postal worker, there was resistance to him being there, um, and he was kind of taken off from that uh, position for a moment in time, and then restored, mm. uh, and also um, op opened up uh, also the movement for the labor movement to, to really be refined in, in that uh, particular area. So that book can be found at a different book list, mm. as well as uh, a wealth in of other in Toronto, uh, a wealth of um, children's books and, and other books uh, where people can tap into uh, Black history um, from the different corners of the earth. Dr. Cooper, any recommendations? Well, can I recommend my book? Yeah. Okay, everyone can recommend their own book. So please do. Okay, it's recommended actually, just so that you know, I don't know if you could hear. Dr. Flynn also recommended your book. Okay, she said so the she hanging of Angelique. Yes, so I won't say that. The hanging of Angelique. I'm also going to recommend um, Harvey Amani Whitfield's book, which is just hot off the press. Um, he's a his, uh, historian at, at Vermont. And it's called North to Bondage, Loyalist Slavery in the Maritimes. I also think of um, David, David Austin's book, mm -hmm. Fear of a Black Nation. I just read that, yeah. Fear of a Black Nation. I was going to say Fear of a Black Planet, but that's, yeah, that's public, the public enemy. enemy. <laughs> Fear of a Black Nation, Montreal in the 60s by David Austin. Then there's um, Bolu Ebanda de Berry. He edited this book that Nina Maroney is also in. It's called The Promised Land. And, you know, it's one of those titles that you said there again, but some fantastic essays in that book called The Promised Land. Um, tons and tons and tons. It's okay, we can you also... You know, the, there is also a hashtag. Oh, People yes. People can look for the hashtag. Black Canadian Syllabus. Black Canadian Syllabus. And it has a lot of great reads. So I, I would recommend the hashtag, Black it, Canadian it's a, Syllabus. It's, it is a great one. Um, so, yeah, lots of... And I, I have... Nikki mentioned the young 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 people, people in primary school. That's, that's amazing. I have two kids book. My name is Henry Bibb, Story of Slavery and Freedom. My name is Phyllis Sweetley, Story of Slavery and Freedom. And it's for that, that, that age group. Oh, yes. I have both of them for my future children. Yes. Oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> then there's a Rocky Jones autobiography. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, out. you know, biographies and autobiographies are fantastic, yeah. right? And so Rocky Jones, um, edited by also George Eliot Clark and James Walker, on um, the life and times of Rocky Jones. It is tremendous. I would recommend that everybody must read that book because it's about a, a Canadian civil rights pioneer and icon. Um, so there are tons. Check out the hashtag Black Canadian Syllabus. And Dr. Davis, you introduced me to my first mm -hmm. set of literature about Black Canada, and I literally came in today to the studio with my old <laughs> syllabus from undergraduate school that I was reading last night to just refresh myself on everything. So can you give our viewers any other recommendations? On yes, I'll, I'll check out? offer foreign novels that that allow us to look at four different geographic spaces. So Essie Dugan's The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, I mentioned earlier, which looks at um, a black community or black communities in, in Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, Meirut Sarsfield's No Crystal Stair, which looks at Montreal in the mid 20th century, the early to mid 20th century. Dion Brand's What We All Long For, which talks about Toronto and, and Larry Hill's um, novel, oh, the, book of the Book of Negroes, which, oh, yes. is, which is Eastern. Yes. Eastern and I was also Canada. made into Amazing. a television series yeah. Yeah. that CBC did, FYI. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's I really good. That, yes, of course, um, I, I, I read a wonderful article written by um, Dr. Afwa here about Angelique. Nice, very nice. Yes, Thank you. I appreciated that. Thank you. Uh, we have um, some more recommendations from online on YouTube. Fundy56 says that the NFB has a great collection of documentaries, very true, on black Canadian experiences such as Speakers for the Dead, uh, Journey to Justice, which was also already mentioned, The Road Taken, and Remember Africville. Ninth Floor can also be found there, um, as well as Sisters in the Struggle. And a lot of those are free actually on the NFB website, uh, and some you can rent for a very affordable price if you are already subscribed to Netflix. So, I want to go around and ask, what gives you hope? What is the thing that is giving you hope right now about this situation in this contemporary moment? Dr. Flynn, I'm gonna start with you. Yes, well, um, Black Lives Matter Toronto um, gives me hope. Um, the, the 
the work that they're doing is so instrumental. And of course, they're building on already a long established, uh, established legacy. I think that the work of you know individual individual people in um, in and around in Canada um, gives me give you know give it gives me hope. I think that um, sometimes we forget the 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 unnamed people, the parents, the aunts, the uncles, um, family members, our community unnamed community people who resist daily, um, resist, resist uh, you know, racism, resist all kinds of microaggressions. And I think that, um, I think about, I think about those people, I think about those unnamed people who continue to teach their children um, a way to feel that they belong to the Canadian nation, that we're not outside of the Canadian, the Canadian nation, that we have a right, um, we have a right and we belong to the Canadian nation, but we don't think about those people. And they, the unnamed people, also give me hope. Thank you for that, Dr. Davis. Black Lives Matter Toronto <laughs> gives me hope because it's a movement that's needed and fresh and vibrant, and it's young. It's made up of young people, university educated, many of them, in the trenches, brave and 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 vocal and second and third generation Canadians, not immigrants, who are naming this country as their own and demarcating the nation in ways that make sense for them. I think it's that for me is my is my hope. Beautiful. Nikki? Well, I I was given uh, um, a wave of hope on Saturday uh, when I was invited um, among other leaders in uh, the community to attend uh, the confrontation against anti-black racism at City Hall. Uh, and I was very um, encouraged when I saw Mayor Tory um, spend the day with us and to um, have these conversations uh, in the different areas that uh, um, have gone by in terms of 41 years of, of you know, accumulated information and documents and really nothing been parlayed into action. Mm -hmm. uh, so to have us all there and give up our Saturdays and sit and have lunch and talk, real talk, about what's going on with policing, with housing, children's aid, all the things that uh, have been identified as, as uh, ills in the community, how we can make it, make a change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That gave me hope. Dr. Cooper, what gives you hope? I would say that in, in spite of the fact that, you know, slavery in Canada, the enslavement of Africans in Canada, that institution um, um, set the tone for uh, subsequent generations and this idea that we have, you know, that uh, of black inferiority and white superiority, that's one of the legacies of slavery mm -hmm. and the color bar that was set in place for black people. So you can be, you, you're meant to be, uh, um, choppers of wood and drawers of water, whatever the saying is. Throughout the centuries, throughout the centuries, that black people in this country have revolted against that idea that we are meant to be there and not move. Um, in spite of the fact that today we have, you know, massive incarceration rates in Canada. In fact, Canada um, incarcerates African Canadians at a higher rate than, than the Americans. Mm. Um, in spite of the fact that we have all these children seized by child welfare agency, mm -hmm. and we still have a high dropout rate in, high. In, in, in high schools, yeah. um, I'm still hopeful because there, there is this resistance against it throughout all of Canada. Um, people are saying no. And this terrain, this terrain of knowledge um, is one way, is one terrain in which we wage a struggle for our humanity and for our dignity. And we're saying no to things that brutalize us. And so I am hopeful, I'm very hopeful. I'm actually very enthusiastic, very uh, optimistic, almost ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> because of what I see we're capable, that what we have done over the centuries and what we continue to do in celebration of our blackness and in celebration of our humanity. Hmm. I, Ashe, Ashe to that. Um, <laughs> I wanna say thank you to all of you for joining us and all of you at home as well for joining us in this digital discussion. Please keep the conversation going online and thank you again to our guests, Karen Flynn at the University of Illinois Afua Cooper at Dalhousie University, 
Nikki Clark, president of the Ontario Black History Society, and Andrea Davis from York University. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. If you want to see more programs about Canada's history, check out the Canadian History section on watch.cbc.ca and on ec.2.tv. Hashtag stay woke. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.